Uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Shannon Barrett from uh, Weed Smart, and today you're joining us for our Q and A webinar for our new Crop Competition 101 course. Um, today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Witterick from Queensland's Department of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries. Did I get that right, Michael? It was close. <laughs> Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. <laughs> um, Dr. Gurjeet Gill from the University of Adelaide and our Western Extension Agronomist, Pete Newman. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Um, just before we kick off, I just want to introduce, we introduce Weed Smart a little bit. Um, so Weed Smart is an industry-funded communication platform um, delivering science-backed weed control solutions. And I would just like to acknowledge our stakeholders. Uh, everybody above the line that you can see are our financial stakeholders um, and everybody below are our in-kind stakeholders. So without um, the contribution of these companies, we would not be able to operate. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to kick over to Pete now to um, introduce the, the course and the webinar. So over to you, Pete. Thanks, Shannon. You might need to stop sharing your screen so I can share mine yeah. and uh, we'll get into it. So, yeah, good. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us, as Shannon has said. Today is really a Q&A session um, for people that have done the course or anyone who has a question at all. And so what we're going to do is just uh, have a very quick overview from uh, Michael and um, Gurjeet uh, and uh, and just hear a little bit about their presentations and then we'll just do questions only. So if you have a question, please make sure you ask it. You can ask it either by putting a question into the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask one live. But I have some questions, so um, if we don't have any come in, that's fine. So I'll, I'll start with Gurjeet. Gurjeet, if we just cover your stuff in the first half of this webinar and then we'll hand over to Michael for the second half. Just, if you could just give us that couple of minutes of overview about crop competition. I know it's hard to sum it up into two minutes, but um, just that, that, that quick overview of the, of the aspects of crop competition that you covered, Gurjeet, and then we'll get into some questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, I'll take one step back first and uh, you know, put a, a question, I guess, as to why uh, we seem to be uh, having renewed interest in crop competition. Uh, a few years ago, I guess, it was seen more relevant, I guess, for organic farmers or someone who wasn't keen on using herbicides. But I think the, it, now we're starting to realise that crop competition basically underpins our weed management. So, uh, um, and, and we, uh, here I'm talking about both the immediate benefit, the short-term benefits of crop competition when we're using herbicides is that we're still minimizing our yield loss from the weeds that survive the treatment. And the other one is it also plays a really important part in reducing our future infestations of weeds. So we're not winning them in the short term, but we're also reducing populations in the long term. So we're seeing the benefits over many years from the reduced population. Uh, so in this uh, course, um, I, I'm covering four different aspects of weed competition, starting off with the uh, crop seed rate, uh, crop density, you know, and how that actually uh, can be used to uh, reduce the impact of weeds and suppress the uh, seed output. Uh, in the second module, I'm focusing on early sowing or enhancing our crop competition, the vigor of the crop through sowing the crop at a time when conditions are ideal for it to bounce out of the ground and compete with the weeds vigorously. Um, and this is almost a bit of a turnaround here that in the past we used to talk about how delayed sowing might be beneficial. And what we are seeing now increasingly is that early sown crops invariably uh, give you higher yields because that's just the agronomic penalty, I guess, if you delay sowing. But we're also seeing that they're also more suppressive of the weeds, so we're reducing the weed seed set. In the third module, uh, we, we look at crop row spacing. Uh, as you all know, uh, growers have widened row spacing in most situations to handle the stubble as they went into no-till. Uh, so there are obviously uh, issues tied with that in that if we go to really wider spacings of 30 centimetres or more, uh, we're giving weeds a lot of resources to grow in and uh, build up. 
So uh, that's the third module. And in the last module, uh, my fourth module, I'm looking at uh, the traits of the crop in terms of the vigor and how we're getting to a point where we're getting, you know, very close. All breeding companies now have these high vigor wheats, and I think we're going to see quite an exciting time in a couple of years where our growers will have hands on these competitive wheats as well. So, so they're going to be my four modules, Pete, um, on. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, QJ. And my first question for you is you opened up by saying, you know, we thought it um, might have just been interested by organic farmers, but now it's everyone. Um, yeah. I've often sort of said that back in the day when all the herbicides worked, for example, imagine if hoe grass just killed rye grass. We don't yeah. really have to worry about crop competition, do we? Because weeds come mm -hmm. up, you just spray them and they die. Exactly. Whereas now that uh, we are both reliant on preems, which are not the sort of 99% herbicides, uh, and we have herbicide resistance. That's why we need to focus on crop competition. Is that your take on it as well? Yep. No, excellent, excellent point, Pete. Uh, in that we've lost a lot of herbicides through resistance, so our growers are having to rely on preems, as you said. And to make matters worse, I guess we're also seeing a lot of erratic starts through the seasons, uh, dry starts, for example, where preems tend to struggle even more, which means competition becomes even more critical for our growers as, as a tool for managing weeds. Yeah. Thanks, Gizu. Okay, well, let's just go through your just a few of your slides. So I've got some of your slides here, and if we start with seeding rate, there's lots of seeding rate trials and suppression on weeds, and it's pretty much an increase your seeding rate, decrease your weeds. Mostly, we can say in terms of weed biomass and weed seed set, there's some data of mine. Mm -hmm. the, the same trial, I think, uh, but this time with plus Sakura. Yeah. Uh, and you have, you know, multiple trial results here showing increased seeding rate reduces weed seed set. Now, my question is, how do we choose the seed rate? So, and, mm -hmm. and it's related to row spacing as well, I think. I've often thought that if we're on wide rows and we keep increasing the seeding rate, we're trying to mm -hmm. cram lots of seeds into a, a little bit of row so yeah. at what point do we stop and should we target a, a seed a crop plant density for a mm -hmm. given row spacing and then work back from there is that how we should think about it that's right so so yeah you're right uh think that uh, we should be talking about crop density um so we're finding that for cereals we're certainly seeing benefits of increasing our wheat or barley plant density uh, up to at least 200 plants per square meter. Uh, obviously, where the row spacings are wider, uh, you're cramming too many plants into a row that increases the competition among crop plants. So that brings in the other aspect of uh, row spacing, I guess, that we also keep keep in mind, I guess, when opportunities arise for growers when they're changing their seeding gear, perhaps they could also explore the possibility of, uh, you know, can they reduce the row spacing a bit. But you're right. So aiming for 200 to up to 220, 30 uh, plants per square meter. And the message, I guess, in these slides is also that uh, the concern about screenings uh, that used to be what was holding farmers back from increasing seed rate uh, doesn't show through when we look at the trial data. Uh, in fact, you get more uniform seed size and screening levels don't increase. So this is where I think there's been some confusion between high nitrogen rate versus high seed rate. If we don't push our nitrogen rates too much and increase the seed rate, and, not, and you don't have to do it over the whole paddock, perhaps with the new technology, we increase the seed rate in our weedy patches. So that's where the variable rate, I think, really come, becomes even more important that we can treat the zones, the weedy zones, and bump up our seed rates there to get the benefits. Thanks, Gurjeet. So I've, I've been encouraging growers to measure their seed size, particularly yes. uh, with uh, cereals, yeah. and then decide on a plant density and then mm -hmm. calculate your seed rate from there. Is that your approach as well? Yeah, perfect, uh, what you just said. Because we know in our environment, uh, given the, how uh, springs tend to be so variable now, you know, uh, we've had uh, grain 
size vary by a factor or two between seasons, you know. So if you get a really dry spring, your seed weights can be down to uh, 27, 30 milligrams in wheat. But it's in a good season, they'll be over 40, 45. So no point in using the same seed rate in kilograms per hectare. Because, and so weighing, having a good feel for what your seed size is and adjusting your seed rates accordingly between seasons is absolutely vital. Yeah, I can see that Paul McIntosh raised his hand and he's got a question here. Does high plant density increase lodging effects? Have you seen anything to do with that, Vijay? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, more of a concern in barley rather than in, in wheat because barley does tend to have somewhat weaker stem, especially in some varieties. Uh, so we're more comfortable in wheat and that we're not going to see this problem. And also, if we're not pushing our nitrogen rates too much, you won't see that problem. So, you know, I'm very comfortable with wheat and uh, that we can push the seed rate without uh, having any risk of, uh, of lodging. Excellent. Thanks for the question, Paul. And I do remember when I was doing some of this work myself and I was talking about high plant densities, the barley people would often pull me up a little bit and, and, and say that it may not be necessary to go to as high a plant density with mm. uh, barley as wheat. We also know that barley is competitive because it has that more prostrate growth habit. So yeah. would you agree that we may not need to push barley plant densities as high as wheat? That's right. Uh, I think we can uh, get the same benefits even at 20, 25% lower density mm. than wheat um, because of that inherent species differences in competitiveness. So absolutely, you're on. on right on the mark there. Excellent. Thanks, Gurjeet. Now, if we can move on to your next module, which was about early sowing. And as you said, we used to talk about delayed seeding, get a good knockdown, then put the crop in. And I've heard from yourself and Chris Preston a lot from your research in recent years that um, you guys have turned the full circle there and are now strong advocates of early sowing to get that competition, get the crop away when it's warm. I've got some yep. of your slides here. And mm -hmm. do you have any... Just opening comments there about about that flip that you've seen during your career from yeah, recommending yeah, delayed no, sowing to now recommending early. That, that's right. No, no, uh, so in this current DRDC project, we've been focusing on this particular aspect quite a lot because, um, you know, we're getting these erratic starts to the season and seasons are getting shorter. So, um, you know, uh, people have all been concerned about delayed sowing anyway. So we wanted to get some data on what impacts uh, does the delayed sowing have. And basically consistently what we are finding is that we're getting, uh, by delaying sowing, sowing into the colder time of the year, our crops are losing vigor. And as a result, they're just not competing effectively with wheat. So this example up here, Minipa, in fact, was a, is a population which is, has very low dormancy. So it's one of like the old style populations of ryegrass, which comes up very quickly once it rains. So we did get good benefits in this in terms of weed seed set because we killed more of the ryegrass by delayed sowing. But it came at, if you go to the next slide, it came at a big penalty even for yield in this particular situation. So we would kill the weeds but there is a massive penalty because the growing season at, at Minipo is short, so we're losing nearly a ton in, in wheat yield. So, so what I'm saying to advisors is that even in these low dormancy populations, even though we've done well in killing more ryegrass, but we're paying a huge amount of money in terms of uh, the opportunity here for, for higher yield. So if you look at the green bars there, which is our top treatment, Secura Evidex, We've killed virtually all ryegrass, but we would have been still better off sowing early in this situation because of that big difference penalty that we've had in yield loss. In our, at other sites where we have more dormant populations, we've lost on both counts. So if you go a bit further, uh, keep go to the next trial, Peter, if you can, if you keep going. Roseworthy, uh, a bit further down. Okay. Yep, yep, yeah. And Maribel. Yeah, okay, Let, let's look at this one. So in this particular trial on brome grass, what we're finding is that, um, you know, we, we, we're doing a, a seed set 
we're doing our setting ourselves backward back because even though we killed more brome by delayed sowing the brome that survived in the later sown crop has really loved it you know it just got produced even more seed so you delayed and you lost in terms of weed seed set but also in t if you we look at the yield uh yep sorry i'm jumping around a little bit there yep. is there. Yeah, let's look at the yield here. So now we're losing in terms of yield, uh, early sown crop, and we also lost in terms of the weed seed set. So, and we're seeing that, this consistently, that in a lot of our modern populations on farms, they're not like the old style, you know, as soon as it rained, it, the paddock screened up. These populations are very slow moving, they are dormant. So by delayed sowing, we, we are not killing much in terms of weed numbers and we're losing in terms of competition effect. Uh, so we're losing yield and we're also setting more weed seeds and that's showing up consistently in many trials. So, so that's where my thinking is sort of now done full 360 feet, that we are now seeing more and more examples where delayed sowing in fact is costing us both in terms of seed set for the future but we're also losing up to a ton in wheat yields, simply even by a three week delay. You know, we're not talking about months here, only about two to three weeks penalty can also be very large in our, our cropping systems. Yeah, that's good news, isn't it, Yuzu? Because that's yeah. the way our farming system has moved to try and maximize yield, which is obviously what we're trying to do. And so yeah. if we can then turn around and say, we can use that to our advantage for weeds as well, then uh, we're winning in both counts then. Yeah. Um, if I so can add, add one more point here, Pete, uh, yeah. don't need to go to any slide, that if anyone was thinking about sl some delay, you know, because they may have really, really paddocks, I guess, what I would say is that with barley, it, barley is a lower risk situation because one, it's got more vigor, but also it tends to it finish earlier. So I guess if someone's going to try uh, slight delay because they want to pick up a few more weeds with their knockdowns. Barley is a safer bet than wheat. So I think with wheat, I would say that delayed sowing is not is going to pretty well uh, not not give you beneficial results in most situations. Yeah, but as no, barley no. might in some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good one. Righto. Let's move on now to the mm -hmm. topic of row spacing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a topic that I love, but it's a hard sell. The reason I love it is it's higher yields and fewer weeds. Um, yeah. And look, you've got to look at this bit of data here, don't you? That is, mm -hmm. if there's ever been a more perfect piece of research data done, then <laughs> that is it. Uh, Dave Minky should have retired after he produced this bit of data, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> because it's beautiful, isn't it? It just shows yeah. higher seeding rate, lower row spacing. But, you know, if we look at it, it's 400 kilo seed rate and 90 mil row spacing, so it's not really mm. achievable. But what I think he is suggesting is perhaps moving from here, the top of this yeah. red bar, if you can see my cursor, to mm -hmm. the blue bar there. So maybe a higher seeding rate and slightly narrower row spacing to have the ryegrass seed set. So yeah. really, I mean, row spacing um, is a great tool, but a hard sell. Um, yeah. Any comments from you about how growers can achieve it in the easiest possible way without having to go to necessarily the extreme of narrow row spacing that might affect this double handling? Yeah, no, I agree with you. This is a challenging one, and all, and I see it as more a medium-term goal for growers because some things they can implement fairly quickly, whereas changing row spacing and you know which may mean that you may only be able to do it in five years from now if you're looking at changing your seeding bar or you know so it's a more a longer-term proposition. Uh, what I also like about this work from Dave Binky is that it also brings on the message that. If you're in wider rows, simply by going to higher seed rate is not going to fix your problem. So your crop is still going to be handicapped because there is a big gap there for the weeds to thrive in. Um, so I think growers need to, uh, you know, keep this as one of their objectives, but I suspect they won't be able to sort of implement it like next year or in the next growing season. But if you are looking at switching changing your seeding gear well then if you can have a better 
residue handling system, which will allow, you know, allows you to come back to 10 inches or, or lower. I think that should be the goal rather than being out there at 12 or more inches in terms of row spacing. Uh, so that's how I see it. The evidence from scientific point of view is clear cut. There, there is no doubt that wider rows lead to uh, greater opportunity for weeds to grow in and set seed. And that virtually shows up in every trial feed. So, uh, but changing is, is, is a hard thing because it does cost a lot of money and uh, is, is, a, is a difficult task. It does, and it, and I do understand why growers are reluctant to change row spacing, absolutely, um, because they just need to make sure that when the backpack is on the machine in the middle of the night, that the machine is still going to be going through the stubble. Um, however, there are a lot of growers are moving to paired row sowing, like a splitter boot. The stiletto mm -hmm. boot is popular in WA, and there's a the root boot and others. Have you yeah. seen any trials on the paired rows or um, do you have any thoughts on the benefit of them compared to changing the number of tines on the bar? Yeah, I think paired rows uh, obviously give you uh, better residue handling, I guess, even and still get a bit more, uh, uh, you know, coverage, early sort of cover, uh, canopy cover from, from the crop. Uh, but I haven't seen any data in terms of uh, benefits in terms of weed suppression. But from principal's point of view, it sounds like like a good thing, uh, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll leave that one there. And we'll just mm -hmm. move to your, uh, I think this is your final module, uh, which was about uh, crop competition. Uh, yeah. I've worked with you a little bit over the years with yes, this, which yes. was great, looking at yeah. the old... Yeah. A40 and uh, so on, those breeding yeah. lines from Greg Rebetsby that yourself and Michael Zerner That's researched right. and yeah. some of these beautiful, vigorous lines yeah. uh, and and so on. Now, you mentioned that growers potentially could have access to more vigorous lines soon. Can you give us yeah. any sort of an update there? Well, uh, I, I guess uh, breeding obviously moves at a slow pace, uh, but uh, since last year, uh, all breeding companies um, have access to the best of uh, these high vigor lines. They himself, uh, themselves actually picked out the uh, the backgrounds they wanted uh, from Greg. So, so to me now, because it's in the hands of your AGTs and Intergrain and all the others, uh, I think it should then now move at a rapid rate because it's within their own programs now, and they will be able to deliver. To growers, for example, in WA, the lines which are going to be well adapted to your soil types and your conditions, you know. So to me, that's quite exciting that we're not just looking at lines which will be uh, produced out of Canberra and may not be that suited to um, to, to in, uh, South Australian or WA growers and, and others, that they in fact will come tailored for individual uh, production zones and I think they should make a big difference in terms of um, bumping up uh, competitiveness further. Yeah, thanks Gizri. Uh, but, but one point to add there also Pete is that even with these bigger lines all the other principles that we've talked about you know your row spacing, your seed rate and everything else that will still apply. You know, it doesn't mean that once you've got these high bigger lines you can forget about all the other good agronomy that, that we've been discussing in terms of improving competition. That is my final question for you, Gurjeet. You've talked about seed rate, row spacing, sowing time and cultivar. How many of those things does a farmer need to aspire to? Do they need to try and do all of them or should they, and how additive is it? If we keep adding competition tools, do yeah. we get, continue to get that step up or is it a diminishing return for the last ones that you add, if you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a that's a, a challenging and an interesting perspective. Um, what I think some of the tactics are very easy to stack together. So, so just an example I was thinking of is uh, sowing time. So we talked about early sowing, um, seed rate. Um, you know, uh, up to what is agronomically the the most suitable for your environment, uh, and. Um, at least those two will easily go hand in hand. You know, you can you can change them very easily. So, so to me, if you're tailoring your program and looking at sowing time and seed rate, um, and seed rate, as we 
discussed earlier, the high seed rate doesn't have to be over the whole paddock or whole farm. You know, if you know about your zones and you're confident about your zoning, you know, you, you know where your high seed rates will be. So that way you're not carting extra more seed than you necessarily need to at seeding time. Uh, to me, those couple, uh, some of those type systems can be changed very, very easily. Uh, early sowing and seed rate. Row spacing more difficult because you're looking at having the right seeder to be able to uh, narrow the row spacing. And, uh, and the other one we mentioned in this one of the modules is soil health. Um, now that is even longer term goal because the shorter term, I think we still re retain our residues because they help in erosion prevention. But what we are seeing increasingly is that once you start to build up your soil carbon, organic matter, we also start to improve our soil microbial populations. They become more beneficial bugs in the soil and you start to see uh, healthier root systems which are going to help the crop in terms of uh, outcompeting the weeds. So that to me is the longest term horizon. The medium term is, I guess, your row spacing, and the short term is your uh, sowing time and seed rate combinations. So that's how I would view them in, the, in that horizon sense. Pete? Yeah, thanks, Peter. And we also saw from Chris Davey from uh, YP Ag in South Australia did some trials last year, and they uh, switched to the, the better herbicide package. They switched mm -hmm. from wheat to barley, uh, mm -hmm. to from an uncompetitive barley to a competitive barley, and exactly. to east-west sowing. And all of those mm -hmm. things were pretty easy to implement yeah. uh, and had an enormous difference on the exactly. seed set. So, exactly. yeah, it is working out which are the really the easiest and cheapest tools to stack, isn't it, in the short term? And then, right. as you say, having some other long-term goals. Exactly, exactly. And, and you have a really good slide up on the screen. To me, that's a classic in terms of demonstrating the value of narrow row spacing, uh, the Glenn Reithmuller's work at Meriden, because it just so clearly shows that once you start going above 18 centimetres, there's quite a sharp uh, takeoff in terms of the weed seed set. So crops start to become less competitive as we go into the you know, past 10 inches. Um, so a really nice sort of reminder, I guess, of uh, if we ever needed any convincing, I guess, uh, about row spacing benefits. Well, here it is. I've got a, uh, a question come in here, Gurjeet. It says, uh, if you're deciding to dry seed, as we're doing more of in the south these days and the west, mm -hmm. how do you come to terms with not using the knockdowns pre-sowing and ending up with obviously more weeds in crop when you don't? have a knockdown. What, how do you think about it, Gurjeet, in terms of, I guess it's probably about choosing which paddocks to dry sow, isn't it, and making sure that you're not trying to yeah. do that into a massive seed bank. Yeah, no, that's exactly the, the point here, that you obviously can't seed all the farm, you know, in a day, so I guess you, you, you rank your paddocks according to their weediness potential. And, and, and start with the ones uh, which have the lowest weeds this year and they, they, they are the ones you're going to go in dry. The other thing is that sometimes you may have to seed more than half of your crop dry because if, if the break is really late, um, well, waiting in, you know, you're really shrinking your window and you might be waiting for too long. And the other thing that I've said is sometimes we overestimate how much we're killing with our knockdowns as well. So if you're getting really late start and you haven't had that much rain, waiting might only give you 10% weed kill, which still won't be enough. So to me, if in that situation, I would still be putting more of my paddocks in, in dry and, and be wanting to take advantage of that warmer growth conditions for, for weed control. And then you may have to pick up a few volunteers and extra weeds within your crop. So if you do have options, I guess you will be able to clean them out. But it's a challenging one if we are going to get those, those really uh, long, dry phases at the beginning. Thanks, Gigi. Um We do need to keep on moving. We've probably mm -hmm. uh, given you more time than I was supposed to already. Yeah. But thank you for joining us. We'll keep you on the line. And if another question comes in, we'll throw it back to you. But thank you very much for, for all of that. I, I think... You know, as you say, a lot of these things scientifically are almost a no-brainer, but uh, mm. the challenge next is to work out how to put them into practice.
Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next module in the course was East West Sewing. I'm not going to spend much time on it. We don't have Catherine with us today, um, but it was that very short, uh, well, she did it not short, but she did a fantastic job of demonstrating this research. And this is global phenomenon. It's not just Australia that there's people all over the world finding the same thing where East West Sewing leads to more shading of the interro. And the further from the equator you are, the greater the effect. There are some situations where it can't be done and there are plenty of situations where it can and it's free. So uh, a fantastic bit of research, halving ryegrass seed set. Um, if you have any questions about East West Sewing, throw them in the chat box and I'll see if I can answer them. Um, but we will throw now to Michael Witterick, who has joined us. Uh, Michael, I'll jump straight to module eight there. I think we start with module seven for you. Um, Michael, if you, once again, as Gurjeet did give just that two minute overview, you don't have to go through what you covered in each module, but um, just that, that wider thinking about what you're seeing in, in your part of the world in that northern cropping system. Are people starting to take a look at crop competition factors or is it a bit of a hard sell there? Okay, thanks for that, Pete. Um, in terms of the bigger, bigger picture with crop competition, um, it's certainly something that more northern growers are considering. Uh, we're in um, an environment where we can grow both winter and summer crops. Um, so it's slightly different than the, the picture that Gurjeet has painted um, for the southern and western regions. Um, but certainly crop competition is coming into play, largely because of the same reasons that Gurjeet mentioned in terms of we've got a range of difficult to control uh, weeds. We've got an increase in herbicide resistance in a number of our weed species. So growers um, on the whole are looking for alternatives rather than relying on their herbicides alone. So the modules that I'm presenting, uh, well, three of them, there was modules seven, eight, and nine, they're, they're largely focusing on growing a competitive summer crop um, and looking at the value in doing that. Uh, so in, in looking at summer crop competitiveness, uh, presented a module on early crop vigour. Now, in contrast with what Gurjeet has presented, there hasn't been a lot of research done on um, the different uh, varietal differences for some of our summer crops. Um, and there's not a lot of energy at this stage being put into breeding for competitiveness in summer crops. So that's something that I'm hoping in the very near future will be something that crop breeders will um, concentrate on and, and, and look into. Um, and, and similar to, as Gurjeet has already mentioned, uh, presented some work that's been done on row spacing and increasing sowing density. One of the things that I wanted to raise in terms of summer cropping is it's um, heavily reliant on your available soil water. And so a lot of the decisions behind whether or not you're going to grow a competitive summer crop will come back to uh, what water resources you have um, and what the likely season is going to deliver. So I think from that perspective, it um, makes it a hard sell in some of our more marginal cropping regions or regions where rainfall is a little less reliable in the summer. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that we have in the north with, with growing competitive summer crops. Thanks, Michael, um, for the overview. And if we just jump into some of your um, your slides now, you mentioned that we're not seeing um, breeding for competitive traits in your crop cultivars, but you do have a big difference in competition between species of crop. And you really mentioned here that our grass crops, which are sort of these lines here, are uh, intercepting more light than, say, our leggy crops. Um, but one observation I would make is that, yes, that's true, pigeon pea doesn't look like it very much at all, but cow pea, on the other hand, is a legume, isn't it? And it mm. has done pretty well in comparison to the grass crops. That's correct. So generally speaking, um, you're right, Pete, that our, our grass crops are going to be the ones that um, have better early vigour and better shading of those early emerging weeds that are in crop. 
Um, one of the things I presented um, throughout the modules is that um, the importance of having that early vigor um, because uh, weeds that are coming up early in your crop are having the largest impact on your crop yield. Um, so the slide that you've actually got presented up there is combining data that we've got from some cover crop research and some grain production research that we've, we've done. Um, and while generally speaking, the grasses do provide um, quicker light interception, some of those pulse crops are able to um, over time compensate and catch up. But in those early stages, generally speaking, your broadleaf legume crops will be um, less competitive than your grass, grass summer crops. Mm. Excellent. Any other comments from you about um, the cultivar, dip, well, the species difference? Um, I mean, there's some cultivar data there that you said we're a little bit light on in the in the north, but um, absolutely. So um, that slide there in particular is looking at three different uh, mung bean cultivars. Now we've we've tested a range of different mung bean cultivars and their growth both in the field but also in, in pot type experiments um, to measure things like rate of growth, height, leaf production and, and, and whatnot. Um, this example here was from the field where we've got barnyard grass um, present as our weed species that we've been monitoring. And you can see very clearly there that we are getting differences in terms of the suppression of barnyard grass seed production under our different cultivars. Um, if you actually go to the next slide, um, Pete, I think slide 51 there, it, it's very interesting because when you think about competitiveness, um, you want to understand a little bit why we're getting the results we're getting. And this here um, is looking at the canopy cover that we're getting from those same three mung bean cultivars. And what we're finding, it, tell, it tells a very nice story where we're getting the um, higher level of canopy cover is where we're getting the greatest level of suppression of our barnyard grass, which was the weed um, that was presented in the previous slide. So that canopy cover um, is one of the keys in terms of having a competitive summer crop. Um, and as we talked about earlier, that's going to differ for our crop species, but also our cultivars within our summer crop species. Thanks, Michael. If, if we just move straight into row spacing now, um, with your row spacing research, you've got some beautiful photos like this where the narrower rows, you know, the soybeans are completely covering the ground compared to having the light, you know, get hitting the ground in the wide rows. Um, but if narrow row spacing is a hard sell in the south, it's an even harder sell in the north, I think, isn't it? Because you have it this is. situation, particularly for your summer crops, where you're trying to conserve moisture out in the between wide rows uh, for that grain fuel period. What do you think about row spacing? Is it, are you thinking about it, apologies for the motorbike in the background, are you thinking about it in terms of um, a, a, like a medium to longer term uh, tool to adopt, a little bit like Gerge mentioned? I think so. I think Crop competition is one tactic, one weed management tactic that we have. Um, it's like when you consider any tactics, you have to weigh up the pros and cons for your particular scenario. So what, um, what farmers or agronomists need to consider when they're thinking about crop competition, row spacing, increasing sowing density, they need to weigh up the positives and the negatives in terms of applying that on a particular farm or in a particular system. Now, one of the things that we have not presented, and probably I haven't presented because it's a bit beyond my understanding, is the economics behind growing a competitive crop. Um, and obviously the economics of changing your machinery to be able to grow your summer crops at a narrow row spacing, that's one of the key barriers. Um, but as you've put up there, much of the research that's been done more recently shows that there can be positive gains in terms of your crop yield by going to a narrow row spacing. So as you mentioned when you were discussing with Gurjeet, the, on the whole, it's a win-win situation. With narrowing your row spacing, you get improved weed control in crop, 
um, but you also, generally speaking, get your increases in crop yield. However, in the northern region, I would put a little caveat on that, is that it comes down to the resources that are available for your crop. So in those more marginal cropping areas, uh, there is risk associated with going to a narrow row spacing if your crop runs out of uh, soil water, especially around that reproductive stage where it's um, flowering and putting um, grain fill on. Um, that's when we have seen cases where you get reductions in yield and you get sharp increases in your screenings. Yeah. And so do you think it, the row spacing decision for uh, summer crops could become a species sort of thing? Uh, could it be something like, um, and I don't know the crops very well, but I understand that sorghum is really quite well suited to the wide rows, but other, other summer crops might be better suited to narrow rows? You're, you're right there. Um, so crops like mung bean, the one you've got up there, is probably a little more forgiving um, in terms of going to a narrow row spacing, whereas something like sorghum, um, potentially is where you're going to have those those yield penalties if you run out of moisture. Um, again, there, there's tools, I guess, which are available to a farmer. So things like climate modelling and forecasting um, that can be used as a bit of a, a tool to um, direct the decisions that they're likely to make um, according to what the seasonal forecast may be like. One of the things I didn't cover so much in the modules was if a farmer decides to grow their crop at a wide row spacing, that does make available to them other weed management tools that potentially aren't available at a narrow row spacing. Um, so things like shielded spraying in your wide row crops or inter-row cultivation. So I think it's about weighing up when narrow row spacing may be a beneficial tool to use and whether or not that fits in with your system, with the crop that you want to grow and the season that you're expecting. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I've got a picture of a shield sprayer on the screen there. It's actually for a fairly narrow row um, uh, crop. But, uh, yes, yeah, so I can understand that shield spraying on some very wide rows might well be a, a good tool in your part of the world. The and other so negative I'll go thing... On. If I can just mention the other negative of your wide row spacing crop, as you can imagine, you're really not having much ground cover left behind after your crop mm. as a result of having a wide row crop. So that has several flow on effects in terms of your future water infiltration, um, erosion risks and whatnot as well. So it's not only considering the crop for that season, but it's also the flow on effects that having a wide row crop can have. And many of those effects can be negative. Thanks, Michael. And we'll finish up um, with seed rate. Um, Michael, you've shown us a lot of data, and once again, it's data showing us higher seeding rates, less weeds, you know, and all of this crop competition research shows the same thing. It, it's true. Can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, for example, the decision on the screen to increase your sorghum uh, seeding rate, for example? Mm -hmm. What... Um, what are farmers starting to do and, and what is involved in that decision? Again, I'm going to sound a little bit like a, like a broken record here, Pete, unfortunately. Um, it goes back to the resourcing that's available for an individual plant to grow. So if you consider a crop like um, where you're relying on in-crop rainfall, your typical plant density that you'd be aiming for is probably as low as about three, three and a half sorghum plants up to a maximum of around the five or six sorghum plants per square metre. Now, the situation changes a little bit if you've got an irrigated system. Um, you generally would be able to target uh, a population density anywhere from around the six up to around the 12, going up to 15 sorghum plants a square metre would be a, a bit of a stretch. Um, so, again, it's based around the resourcing that's available and mostly around the, the water availability. Now, sorghum cultivars differ in their ability to tiller. So, some cultivars, for example, will be able to, in a good environment, put out additional tillers 
and provide more competition even at a lower crop density, whereas some sorghum cultivars don't tiller or are less likely to tiller. So they're not then able to take advantage of additional resources if they're present to provide additional competition against in-crop weeds. So they're the types of decision-making questions that farmers and agronomists would need to be considering there. Thanks, Michael. And just had a, uh, a comment from Paul McIntosh again saying that root architecture is a, is a big consideration to whether a crop will perform on narrower rows and achieve better water use efficiency. It's more of a, a comment rather than a question, but um, do you agree with that, Michael? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot happening below ground um, that we don't um, see and sometimes don't consider. Mm. Um, but that will make a big difference in terms of uh, how a crop will grow and how it will compete with, with weeds in crop. Thanks, Michael. Any final comments from you about, um, about crop seeding rates of your northern crops? Not really, but I just wanted to reiterate what you and Gurjeet already mentioned. The data is very, very clear. The data shows very clearly that narrowing your row spacing and increasing your crop density can have a dramatic impact on the growth and reproduction of weeds in crop. So I would just say to anyone who's, who's listening to this or is undertaking this course is not to discount the impact that a competitive crop can have in terms of weed management, not only in that crop that you're growing now, but the flow on effect that it can have for subsequent um, crops that you grow. If you're able to reduce your seed production by 50% up to 75%, it has a huge flow on effect. So weigh up the pros and cons um, and make a decision based on the resources that you have, um, whether or not there's a, a place for crop competition in your farming system. Thanks, Michael. And my final question to you is similar to what I asked Ajit, and that is, which tools should farmers choose first and, and how many of them should they choose? So We've spoken a bit about the different crop competition tools that people have at their disposal. You know, what's the first lever to pull? You're a farmer in Queensland and you think, I need more crop competition. Where do you go first? I think it's, it's very similar to, as Gurjeet mentioned. I think crop density is probably the easiest to apply. Um, probably your crop species choice. Um, as I mentioned, we probably don't have as much information on how our different cultivars compare, so that's a difficult decision to make at the moment. And then more long-term is considering your row spacing. Uh, we haven't done a lot of research in terms of uh, your row orientation, and that's largely because it will have a lesser impact um, the further north you go. Um, so... I, I, I can't say, we haven't done the research, I can't say that there won't be any impact, um, but the impact will be less than what uh, the more southern farming systems see. So um, same story as what Gurjeet said, um, but we don't have the research behind uh, the row orientation and probably not the research to a high degree on, on how our cultivars differ. Thank you, Michael. It's a great summary. And thank you both for joining us this morning. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And, yeah, once again, thanks, Michael and Gurji. The information you presented in that course was excellent. And your yeah, question and answer today is fantastic. It's just so good that we have people like yourselves that have spent your whole careers researching these things and you can just share all of your knowledge in such a short course and people can benefit from that. So, um, yeah. Thank you for, for joining us in the course and, uh, and we really appreciate it. And, and yeah, well, hopefully we'll be able to do a lot more with you in the future. So that's, that's it for now. Um, many of you are doing the course, but if you're watching this and you haven't done the Crop Competition 101 course, you can find it on the WeedSmart website. We have our Diversity Era online learning platform and we'll be rolling out more webinars on a regular basis through WeedSmart just due to this COVID-19 lockdown situation. This is how we're all communicating these days, so we'll be continuing to do a lot more of it. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Michael and Gurjeet. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks.